Well, thanks again uh, for your welcome, and it's good to be here, and it's also good for the people at Eastwood to have Johnny speaking and sharing there as well. But it does, I think, uh, display the trust between our churches that uh, today uh, Johnny's there and, and I'm here, so thank you for having me. Let's pray as we come to God's Word. Our Lord God, we have just sung what he says we will do. So Lord, we pray that you would open our ears to hear what you are speaking to us and you would empower us through your spirit that we might do the things that you say. For we seek to be faithful as we follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, David asked me about what led me uh, to be coming a pastor and to go back even further before becoming a pastor or in that stage where I was thinking things through I was working as a engineer I was a geotechnical engineer working on construction sites all around Sydney and beyond and I did that for about 10 years and I think it's a I enjoy the fact that I've got an engineering background and being a pastor, I think that, uh, for me, um, helps in many ways. I remember reading the words of J.O. Fraser, a uh, China Inland Mission missionary, now OMF, who was in southwest China amongst the Lisu people. And he would write back to get prayer support from England, and he would say that, I'm an engineer, and I believe in things working and prayer works, so please pray. And so engineers base what they do on whether it's knowing how that material works or how that process works, uh, important things like how gravity works, whatever it might be, and basing what they do on that. And so he was saying, base what you do on the fact that prayer works. And that came from his engineering training. Uh, so. It's worth, I think, for me to reflect on my days as an engineer because it still impacts who I am and even how I read scripture and think about following Jesus. So any engineers out there, um, good for you. That's, that, can, that can be a blessing in your, in your faith. Uh, but I want to just mention about being an engineer because I used to, like many of you would, uh, commute to work by train most of the time. And... I used to catch a train to go to uni, but that was different because timetables always changed and so every day was different, which train I would catch, which carriage I was in. But when I was an engineer and I was commuting to work, it would be the same train, the same carriage, the same door, day by day, day by day, which was an interesting experience because a lot of the people became familiar to me. Even though I was you know, standing room only and we were all kind of crushed together, a lot of the faces were familiar. Not that we spoke to each other or anything. We just sat there and uh, watched. But uh, over that time, uh, I come, came to think about the people in the train. Thinking, oh, where are they going? But it wasn't just a question of where is this train going and where are they going to go next. Uh, it was, became bigger questions. Where are they going in life? And then even bigger questions. Where are they going in eternity? Who are these people that I'm catching this train with? Uh, and what, how are things going to turn out for them? What will become of them? Now that obviously uh, is a huge question for us because we know that the answers to those questions are in Jesus. And so we know that to ask that sort of question, the question is, uh, what do they know of Jesus? And how have they responded to what they know? Or how are they going to know if they don't know? And so I actually filled a lot of those train trips with prayer because I became familiar with some of them. And I was working in youth ministry, particularly amongst boys, uh, back at that stage at Epping Baptist. And so I made the focus of my prayer be the, the boys on the train. So often the boys heading off to school, and so I decided to pray for them. And I still I wonder what has become of them. Uh, not just what happened after school and you know, where they might be working or living. That's not 
that interesting to me. What's more interesting, what will become of them? The big kind of eternity question. That's an important question for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that I remember coming to my mind another time, and that was when uh, it was New Year's Eve many years ago when I was with a group of friends at Bradley's Head. Bradley's Head, it's uh, that little headland that, well, it's kind of long headland that comes down from near where the zoo is at Mossman, and you have a really good view of the, the harbour and the bridge and the city. Uh, and we were there, and if you've ever been to the city on New Year's Eve, there's a lot of waiting, so you have to get there to get your spot. Um, I wasn't the early people. Some other friends went earlier and got the spot. We came a bit later. And, but even then, there's one lot of fireworks and there's more waiting around. At one stage, I walked down this little, uh, it's, it's kind of a little wharf or jetty type thing at the, the end there. And I was looking at the city and I was thinking, there are so many people here. This is a big city we live in. What's going to become of people? Uh, where, all these people who are celebrating tonight, have they heard about Jesus? What are their thoughts about Jesus? Uh, how, what will become of them? And I want you to have that question in mind. What will become of them? Uh, because I think that's a question that uh, is worth having in mind as we come to Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, but beforehand, let's go to Isaiah chapter 1 to see where this question is, is set up. Isaiah chapter 1 is, uh, I guess, starts a bit like a courtroom drama because it begins uh, in verse 2 with God calling people to hear a case. He's like the prosecutor. He says, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. So God is calling all of creation to hear because he has a complaint against his people. He has a complaint that his people who he has raised up, who bear his name, have forgotten him. They've rebelled to the extent that they don't even know who he is anymore. Now we know um, that that actually happened time and time again uh, in the history of Israel and Judah. Uh, remember the story of Josiah, that even the book of the law was lost and forgotten and it, when it was found it was what's this this book of the law let's find out what it is and read it uh, they come to the point where they had even forgotten who god is and so through isaiah god is bringing a message uh, a bit like a prosecutor a complaint uh, that needs to be dealt with he goes on to to say quite a few things uh, about the state of the people of Judah, and particularly focusing on the city of Jerusalem. And he talked about uh, how even when they came with all their sacrifices, it meant nothing to God. Because their sacrifices weren't done uh, knowing God. It wasn't an act of worship. It was just something that they had inherited. And they did. But in the meantime, they had blood on their hands. They were a, a violent people, an oppressive people. And I think particularly, and it comes through in other parts of Isaiah, there's a real focus on those who have the power, whether it's those in religious power or uh, civic power, who have the ability to really oppress others, uh, take land off people, force people uh, to live a hard life while they get an easier life while they get richer and more powerful. And that was the state of Judah. And it gets to this point where, and these are quite famous verses that speak of God's grace, uh, in verse 18, where we're coming, here God is seeking a resolution. He says, Come, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, you may have heard those verses speaking about the stark difference between uh, our sin and then our cleansing through the grace of God. But we can't take those verses in isolation because it's not settled yet. That's what, what's on offer. 
But it goes on to say in verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And the rest of the chapter goes on talking about both scenarios. The scenario where the people are faithful, where they repent, and the scenario for the people who rebel or remain in rebellion. And so we get to the end of the chapter saying, well, which one is it? <laughs> that, that big question I had, what will become of these people? What happens next? Uh, will they remain in rebellion? Will they repent? Will some repent? Uh, what's going to happen next? And it's that big question. What will become of these people? That is hanging over us and hanging over Isaiah as we come to chapter 2. And chapter 2, uh, Isaiah has a vision. And in this vision, it's a vision, not the courtroom drama, this is now a pilgrimage vision. And it tells us that this vision uh, speaks of, in verse 2, what happens in the last days. Now, the last days is a phrase used occasionally in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, looking forward to a time where God kind of decisively acts in history in a way that changes things forever, particularly changes forever how we know God and relate to him. Uh, but it's a bit vague. But then in the New Testament, it actually speaks about it a few times that in these last days, uh, this idea that now that Christ has come, we are in that time of God's decisive, uh, kind of world-changing, history-changing uh, moment where God relates to us in a way that is new. Uh, and so the last days uh, is now, today, this, this period of time uh, between Christ's first coming and second coming, where this unfolding work of God centered around Christ, uh, continued powerfully through the Spirit, uh, we are seeing the things unfold uh, that has been anticipated. Other times in the Old Testament, there's that phrase, the day of the Lord, or in that day, uh, all referring to this time where God changes the way uh, that we can know him. And so... In the last days, there will be this, these events that are displayed to Isaiah in a vision, uh, kind of like a pilgrimage. And a good way to think about this is uh, to think about a bit of the geography. We don't know where he saw this vision from, but I like to think of somewhere like the Mount of Olives, because in the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives... You looked across the Kidron Valley, and then on the other side of the Kidron Valley was the temple, you know, the city of Jerusalem. The interesting thing is that Mount of Olives, at its peak, is about 60 metres higher than the Temple Mount. So you're looking at the temple, maybe even just slightly from above. And pilgrims would, if they were coming from that direction, would come uh, anticipating coming to the temple of God, uh, and they'll come, and they'll come over the Mount of Olives, maybe not at its peak, but come, and at one point they'll be at, a, at level with the temple. And then they'll go down, and then their last part of the pilgrimage, with great anticipation, would be to go up to the house of God. And that idea of going up to the house of God, going up to the temple is... Uh, important language in Scripture, you find it in the Psalms and uh, in, in the Prophets, and it comes in today's passage as well. But something's different, because Isaiah had probably looked across the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives many times, uh, and if that's where he's standing, the vision is, something strange is happening, because this mountain the temple's on, which is really not very high, uh, seems to grow. 
This mountain becomes so significant, so large, uh, that it's higher than all the other mountains. And so we read, uh, in the last days, verse 2, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. And so the temple is no longer somewhere that you could kind of uh, look at at a similar level. It is so high that it, is, it dominates. It's higher than everything else. Now the temple, uh, it's important for us to understand a few things about the temple. Uh, the temple uh, was God's dwelling place in all the world. Where did God dwell? Amongst his people? In the temple. Uh, the temple was the place where God's people could be made right with God. Uh, through the sacrifices uh, which God required, people could be made right with God and have a right relationship with God. Uh, the temple was the place where people would come to, to meet God, uh, to, to pray or to, to give some kind of offering of thanksgiving. And the temple was also uh, a place where it was anticipated that even the nations around might come to worship God. If you want to get a good, I guess, theology of the temple and the purpose of the temple, it's worth reading in 2 Chronicles 6, uh, um, Solomon's long prayer of dedication. So he talks about all these different roles the temple will play. And one of those uh, roles he talks about, I think it's from verse 36, he talks about uh, the foreigner who will come. And Solomon prays, Lord, when this foreigner comes, uh, please answer their prayer when they come seeking you. And then do what they ask. And then they will go and your works will be made known uh, in the nations around. So this sense that the temple uh, would have a significant role in God being known beyond uh, the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And so here he is, uh, seeing God's temple uh, lifted up. Now that's important because we have a people here who have no regard for God's glory. They're going through some motions and sacrifice, but they're only interested in their own glory. And so what God is doing, God is taking his glory into his own hands. He is putting himself on display to the world uh, in his own initiative. It wasn't that often that people got to see the glory of God because the temple had these different places you could go depending on who you were and there was that one room, the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place, where only rarely... Uh, on the Day of Atonement, would one priest go in uh, with the blood of the Lamb? So it's easy to forget the glory of God. <laughs> they weren't meant to, they meant to sing about it and tell the stories. Actually, it wasn't meant to be easy to forget, but if it's all about what you see, maybe they were disappointed at times. But here God is taking his glory and putting it on display for the whole world. He's taking his glory into his own hands. And as Isaiah is watching that, maybe wondering what that means, uh, that's enough to fill his vision. But he notices something. He notices movement around him. Uh, that's not the strangest thing. People do go on pilgrimage to the temple, particularly in large crowds at certain times of the year. But as he notices these pilgrims coming to the temple, this temple that has been lifted up, uh, he notices something. He notices that they aren't all Hebrews. In fact, he notices people coming from all different nations. But I wonder whether his first thought was, oh no, <laughs> We're at war. 
Because the only time different nations would turn up at the doorstep of the city of Jerusalem was for war. And this is something that we see. Um, it even tells a story in Isaiah of the Assyrian army coming right to the door. We know later uh, that the Babylonian army didn't just come to the door, they came through the door. And with those words that we just read in Isaiah 1 saying that for, if they remain in rebellion, they'll be devoured by the sword, you can imagine Isaiah being worried at least for a moment. <laughs> These nations are coming. This is not good news. This is bad news. So in verse 2, all the, and all the nations will stream to it. But then he probably heard. It says, Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And this changes everything. <laughs> These aren't armies of people. These are pilgrims, just like the Hebrews who are coming. The streams of people from all the nations coming to the temple are coming to hear from God, to learn his ways. They are, they are pilgrims, just like the Hebrews. And here, everything starts to change. In fact, considering the fact that the Hebrews are in such great trouble for forgetting God. This is a game changer that here we have in this vision, those who aren't even Hebrews, streaming to the temple to meet God, to, to hear him teach his ways. Because here, not just has God taken his glory into his own hands, he has taken his mission into his own hands. He hasn't left his mission in the hands of those uh, who forgot he even existed. <laughs> and so uh, we see this, I guess, this fulfillment of what Solomon prayed about, <laughs> that the foreigner would come seeking God. But it's not just the isolated pilgrim there are great numbers coming, streaming. And then the picture is that the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So as people come, the word goes out. As people come to worship, to come to hear from God, the word goes out. And there's something else there. There's something else that happens to the people. Because maybe they have come carrying their, their spears and, and swords. That's how they usually travel when they're going to another nation. But the word of God as it goes out transforms them. And these people who had always been hostile, these enemies are now taking their weapons and turning them into tools of productivity. Which is interesting because usually what happens is that most of these nations around wouldn't have had standing armies. And so when there was a war, they'd call all the people together. A lot of people would come from their farms with their pruning hooks or their, their plows or their, their shovels, whatever they were, and then they'll start beating them into weapons. And so they weren't, didn't have a stockpile of weapons. You had to make weapons out of your farming tools. But here it's the opposite. They have their weapons and they're turning their weapons into farming tools. They're going from people who would be aggressors to people who would be productive. There's a transformation taking place. And it's probably appropriate that we even think back to creation and that calling uh, for us uh, as, as humanity uh, to tend to God's creation. It's as though they're coming back to the very essence of their calling as people created by God. 
So great is his transformation. So God has taken his glory into his own hands. He's taken his mission into his own hands. And he's taken the transformation of people into his own hands as well. And so there's a picture of justice, a picture of peace. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This is the last days. This is today. Now, by putting this vision today, we can see problems, can't we? (laughs) We see people creating weapons and training for war. We see a lot of people taking no interest in God. We see the word going out, but... We also see places where the word isn't going out. So how is this come about in the last days? Well, firstly, uh, when we're in the New Testament, in the New Testament era, and we're thinking about the temple, we need to think about Christ. Because Christ is the one who fulfills the function of the temple. He is God with us. God's dwelling place here. He is the one, by coming to him, we are made right with God. So, I guess, specific is this, that he actually becomes the sacrificial lamb. He's the one that we go to in thanksgiving and worship. Just like people would go to the temple. He's the one we go to to call out for help. And he's the one who sends us out. So Jesus completely fulfills the role of the temple. Jesus is lifted up. In fact, that lifting up language... It's applied to Jesus in different ways. It's applied to him on the cross. It doesn't look glorious. But he is lifted up. And Jesus is lifted up uh, in his resurrection, which is definitely glorious. (laughs) Jesus is lifted up as he ascends to the Father's side. And he'll be lifted up again in his return. And we know that in his return, that will be the point where every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Where this vision will be seen in a complete way. But because Jesus takes this on, because God takes these things into his own hands, Uh, in Christ, he can then give it back to us. Because the role of the temple is fulfilled in Christ, he can then pass it back to us. And so us as the church are glorified in Christ. We We are lifted up. Again, that glory is not always obvious to the world, just like when Christ was on the cross. But there are times when it is very obvious to the world, when Christ is risen again. But the glory of God dwells amongst us, in us, because we are in Christ. And just as God took the mission into his own hands, and Christ has shown that Uh, through all the ways that he pronounced and displayed the kingdom of God in his earthly ministry, Uh, he then sends, go into all the world, make disciples of every nation. So he he hands to us the mission of God because 
Christ has taken the mission into his own hands. And because we are in Christ. And the transformation of people, something that everyone is always trying to do, change people. (laughs) Well, that transformation has come through Christ. And now he hands that on to us. Through his teaching, calling us to a way of living that is, displays his love in all that we do. But it's even greater than that. For Christ has given us his spirit, has empowered us. So even though his glory and his mission and the transformation of people is given to us, it is through the power of God. It's not like the people in chapter 1 who just forgot about God. We are with God. We are empowered by him. We are directed by him. We are transformed by him through his spirit because we are in Christ who fulfills all that the people of God lacked in Judah. And then this leaves us with that last verse, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The calling is, Isaiah says to the people of Jacob, people of Judah, come let us walk in the light of the Lord because God is going to take these things into his own hands. And we say it to each other, let's walk in the light of the Lord because God has taken these things into his own hands. We spend a lot of time, I guess, worrying about how we might spread the good news of Christ. We spend a lot of time worrying about are we displaying the glory of God? How can we display the glory of God in this world? We spend a lot of time worrying about how can we change people? But our calling is to come and walk in the light of the Lord. Because as we, like Isaiah, fix our eyes on him, we will notice that movement around us. That God is bringing others to himself. And so evangelism isn't something where, you know, I have to kind of get it within myself. How am I going to do this? Rather it is, I know that in these last days, people from all nations will stream to God looking for him. So I just have to call out to the people of this world, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let us learn his ways. We give invitations because the people longing for God are there. It's kind of like sowing the seed, isn't it? Uh, You don't sow the plant, you sow the seed. And you don't, but when you're, what you're interested in is which ones form a plant. And so we put the invitation out there because this is the last days and there are people from all nations seeking God. Let us not get too worried if the world around us isn't being transformed. Uh, rather, Let's put the invitation out there. Amongst all the injustice, all those who don't want peace, all the violence, and say, let's walk in the way of the Lord. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And as we do that, we start turning our weapons of war into tools for productivity. And those others who are coming, wanting to seek God, will see that that's the way to do it. And as we come to God together, more and more weapons of war will be turned into tools for productivity. And if you're not sure about some of this, just look at this room. (laughs) This room proves that we are in the last days, doesn't it? 
For we are here from many nations uh, seeking God. And it's transforming us. We're not here uh, seeking to harm each other. But we are finding a love for one another. It's exciting to be in this time. That question is we look at our city and ask, what will come of these people? What will become of the people that I saw on the train? Uh, all those crowds that you might move through, uh, whether it's uh, in the university <laughs> or in the shops, in the workplace, wherever it is. What will become of them? But we know this, that Christ has been lifted high. That we can invite people to come and look to him. And say, come, let us go. Sadly, not everyone will. But just like fishing, as Jesus' disciples learnt, you just have to put the invitation out there and walk with those who walk in the light of the Lord. So I was excited to hear that you're going to be sharing stories about uh, those opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with others. Um, so I'd encourage you, don't spend a lot of time uh, being too worried about words and things like that. But as you consider this, uh, marvel at the fact that there are people who, because Christ has been lifted up, will come to know him. Wonder at the fact that there are people around us whose lives will be transformed. And just keep putting the invitation out there. And enjoy being these last days where things are being fulfilled that have been talked about in ancient times. Remember, God's mission is in his hands. <laughs> he gives it to us, but it remains in his hands. So the pressure's off. The opportunity is there. And we can just join in with this amazing work that God has initiated. And we can celebrate uh, with one another that we are the fruit of this already happening. We can look at each other and go, wow. <laughs> Once upon a time we would have been enemies. But because Christ has been lifted up, we are fellow pilgrims and learning to love each other. And we'll call out, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord.